So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this, this event from the Center for Art and Politics. Um, my name is Jeffrey Stevenson Muir. I'm the director of the Center for Art and Politics, and um, it's my, my great pleasure to give a warm welcome to Morag uh, Kersel, uh, who will be our speaker this evening. And um, I'd like to just say something about the format, and then I'll make an introduction, and I'll hand things over to, to Morag. Um, but this evening, um, Morag's going to make a presentation. Um, she'll probably run about 40 minutes or so with the presentation. Uh, we'll then turn to some questions from me for, for Morag directly about the, the presentation and some of its content. Uh, we'll then open the floor for a question and answer session, and I'm absolutely delighted for each and all of you to participate in the conversation. Uh, if you prefer, uh, you can go ahead and put questions and comments in the um, chat. And um, I just will kind of remind people about um, kind of Q&A etiquette. I just posted something in the chat and I'll repost it when we go there. But just the idea that everyone should be muted uh, just to uh, minimize the amount of background noise during uh, Morag's talk. But then if you'd like to, to participate, go ahead and raise your hand. There's a raise your hand function on the top bar uh, that you can see. And um, I'll call upon you and um, then, you know, turn on your microphone. Uh, the you are muted is so 2020. Uh, we've kind of moved on from that. Um, but then uh, when, when you finish your question, uh, you know, take down your hand. And, and if you'd like to return to mute, that's fine. But if it can also be a give and take with Morag. And what I hope is this will all feel very uh, conversational. So um, it's my great pleasure, as I said, to introduce Morag. Uh, Morag Crystal is an archaeologist uh, who works in the eastern Mediterranean in the Neolithic and Coccolithic and early Bronze Age periods. Morag is Associate Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Museum Studies Minor at DePaul University um, in Chicago in the United States. She earned a PhD in archaeology from the University of Cambridge. She also holds a master's in historic preservation with distinction uh, from the University of Georgia and a master's of arts in Near Eastern Studies from the University of Toronto. She holds a bachelor's of arts with honors in classical studies from Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. And in addition to participating in archeological excavations and surveys in Egypt, Greece, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, and Turkey, Morag is interested in the relationship between cultural heritage law, archeology span and objects and local interactions. And of course, some of that is what we'll be discussing um, today. She works on the public display and the interpretation of archaeological artifacts in institutional spaces, and she has published a number of articles and is the co-author with Christina Luke on U.S. cultural diplomacy in archaeology, lovely um, IR subtitle, Soft Power, Hard Heritage, um, that's from 2013, and um, she is co-editor with M.T. Rutz uh, of Archaeologies of Text, Archaeology, Technology, and Ethics, and that came out in 2014. It's uh, my great pleasure to hand things over to Morag, and um, I'll turn it over to you, and then we'll come back and have a conversation. Thank you very much. All right, I'm new to... Uh, can you see my screen now? Someone give me the thumbs up, right? Thumbs up. Yes, awesome. we can see your screen. Okay, so um, I want to thank Dr. Muir for the invitation to share some of my research with you all, uh, you good folks of the Center for Art and Politics. But I want to preface this by saying this is a work in progress because it builds on some really preliminary exploration. The Kate study is newish, it's unpublished, and due to some rabbit holes that I found myself in this week and last week, it's uh, under theorized. I would like to consider this an exercise in thinking out loud and I'm seeking wisdom from you all and input. All right, let me see about, okay, here we go. Uh, it is also a work on hold because I was awarded a Palestine Exploration Fund Albright uh, grant to investigate the hidden histories or the private lives of Levantine Neolithic masks in 2020. And I have yet to take that up yet. And uh, so I um, it is a work in progress, as I've said. So I come to you today as a guest living and working on the traditional territories of the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. 
This is also the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary place for trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen First Nation peoples in the past and today. DePaul University, where I am in Lincoln Park, resides on land that was ceded under duress in 1821. And I acknowledge this uh, painful history. And in my teaching and research, I tried to concentrate on rectifying the ongoing injustices. So, but words are nothing without action. So land acknowledgements are just words. And if we don't act uh, to support First Nations sovereignty and self-determination and education, we are no better than our words. So I would encourage you to donate to the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology uh, group at the University of Alberta because they are doing some really important work investigating First Nations residential schools in order to bring home the lost children. I want to start with a few caveats and disclaimers. So I've tried to credit all the images I'm using today and hopefully there are no copyright violations. All of the ethnographic interviews are conducted um, with protocol review. Sorry, there's a lot of noise out here. Um, hang on just one second, I'll be right back. I'm doing a presentation. Can you keep it down? Sorry. 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 Oh my God. Usually Universal experiences in academia, right? Live in the basement, and usually there is no one here. Today, there are four people out there yakking it up. Okay. Uh, so, all my ethnographic interviews are conducted with protocol review and the appropriate ethical review boards have been consulted. Um, today, I'm going to draw on the work of people like Dennis Byrne, Neil Brody, Chris Chippendale, David Gill, Patty gerson Simon McKenzie, Donna Yates, and Emmeline Smith, and many others, because I don't want you to think I'm a lone wolf in this. I really, it's a big group project. So I want to examine how the loan of Neolithic masks to a museum increased in cultural competence of an individual collector. I contend that the valorization of masks by a variety of actors, academics, buyers, collectors, museums, scientists, and sellers results in what I'm calling capital gains. And we all know the gains of Bourdieu in cultural, economic, social spheres. The terms Israel, Jordan, and Palestine are rarely, if ever, used in museum exhibits. Instead, we get these sanitized euphemisms like land of Israel, land of the Bible, the West Bank, the Levant, and the Holy Land, which are the preferred labels with museums presenting an apolitical stance and reinforcing the universal museum concept of all for antiquities and antiquities for all. The material manifestations of the region speak and belong to everyone. This is particularly true at the Israel Museum, which will be our case study today, and also at the Museum of the Bible. And if you're intrigued by the Museum of the Bible, I hear I'm indulging in some shameless self-promotion. I'm happy to send a copy of this recent article where I examined their issues. So in the love of art, European art museums and their public, Bourdieu and Darbel make a link between highbrow cultural participation and cultural capital. In examining museum visitors, Bourdieu and Darbel suggest that those introduced early in life to highbrow culture and its institutions develop a stronger appetite for cultural participation, like visiting museums, which they then observe leads to a propensity or a disposition to consume cultural goods, which in turn results in greater cultural capital. People with high cultural capital have naturally good taste which gives them a greater social value and possibly a better position in the social sphere. They are predisposed to highbrow culture, um, which require intellectual and aesthetic skills and knowledge to be appreciated. In a later refinement of this notion of cultural capital, Bourdieu distinguishes between three states of capital. We acquire embodied capital through the process of socialization and education. We acquire this capital over time and it's reflected in our mannerisms. Objectified capital is literally, as the name suggests, a reflection of the material things we possess. And institutionalized, institutionalized cultural capital is the recognized form of cultural capital, something that can be certified, such as degrees we possess, the rank or position of our job. It's the measurable aspect of cultural capital. 
Institutionalizing means that the holder of the cultural capital no longer has to prove themselves, for the claim is guaranteed by the state as a prevailing authority over what counts as knowledge. In the following case study, it's the Israel Museum that acts as the guarantor of value that is accumulated in the form of knowledge about artifacts. In displaying, collecting, preserving, and classifying things, the museum acts selectively to make public certain to make public certain objects and narratives while suppressing others. So I want to discuss the individual cultural capital gained through this institutional valorization. And in his examination of East Asian artifacts, Dennis Burns suggests that antiquities are symbolic goods that work to link the aspirational status of individuals to the already established status of larger entities. In 2006, Neil Brody, suggested that museums might set the moral tone, but it's fair to say that the largest private, private collectors set the pace. I'm not sure that museums always set the moral tone. Neil and I debate this all the time, but I agree that private collectors have and continue to set the pace. So I'm gonna draw on their work and, and others to examine the, a collector of Holy Land objects who is setting the pace and realizing their aspirations and the larger institution of the Israel Museum in confirming those desires. In distinction, Bourdieu observes that the physical acquisition of artifacts can be a kind of shortcut to social status. Education, class, refinement, and cultivation are implied by owning artifacts. But, these attaining, but attaining these qualities requires the investment of time, effort, money, and I would argue the imprimatur of an institution. Possessing some special, generally unavailable items and still status on the self and envy in one's competitors. Collections are also a means of demonstrating or claiming this high social status. The distinctiveness of the collection brings distinction to the collector. An underlying motive for amassing great collections is not solely driven by civic minded goals on behalf of the public, but by the desire to display the collector's great wealth and skill at acquiring collections. Infamous Israeli antiquities collector Moshe Dayan justified his self indulgent site raids and purchases by reminding his critics that his collection would eventually be donated to a public institution, which in fact is only partially true, and we could talk about that um, later. So since 2002, my research has focused on the legal and illegal movement of archaeological objects from the Holy Land. To map this movement and to think about flow, I put together this three-part commodity chain of production, distribution, and consumption to help us think about how artifacts move from the ground to the consumer and how laws might affect that movement. This is one of a series of pyramids of movement, which only um, maps the one-way movement from the bottom to the top. So today we're really going to be concerned with the elite collectors at the very top of this. Much of my work involves talking to people about their interactions with sites, objects, and markets. And in the last few years, I've become really captivated by consumers, people who both individual and institutional. Why do people want to own material from this area of the world? And now that I've done over 200 100 interviews, I've noticed some trends and I put together a typology of types of shops and categorize collectors into their habits and motivations and interest in authenticity. So as I said, we're going to concentrate on the elite collectors who seek archaeological objects as a source of cultural capital. They believe that the acquisition of antiquities advances their social mobility as they accumulate status through the purchase of rare connections to the past. They often claim that they're buying artifacts to save them, a characteristic that Burns notes in his examination of these elite antiquarians from Southeast Asia. He suggests that saving antiquities provides the additional gloss when you're amassing cultural capital because you're doing good, right? Yes. The belief that antiquities might prove good vehicles for investment took hold in the 1970s at a time of high inflation, inflation when it was thought that tangible assets might hold their value better than the more traditional financial ones. Clear from this 2006 quote from Michael Steinhardt, he used his economic capital to create cultural capital, which will come back to bite him, as we will see. 
Many of these collectors find validation in their purchases and market acumen from other collectors, but the goal is really having their artifacts displayed in a museum, the institutionalized state of cultural capital. An object in an exhibit is a powerful principle of the symbolic efficacy of if the symbolic efficacy of cultural capital is transmission. What better way to transmit the taste, knowledge, market, and aesthetic skills and expertise of a collector than exhibiting what they own? Between March and September of 2014, the Israel Museum mounted face to face the oldest masks in the world, which was the culmination of nearly a decade of research by the Israel Museum curators and other archaeologists. The exhibit marked the first time that a group of masks from the Neolithic, and that's from about 7600 to about 6000 BCE, was displayed together and the first time most of them were publicly accessible. Opening to much fanfare and press coverage, the Israel Museum brought together 11 of only of only 16 at the time known masks. Since then, two more have come to light, so there are now 18 known Neolithic masks out there in the world. So they brought them together in this groundbreaking exhibition, which was launched to coincide with the Jewish holiday of Purim. Now, you know, Purim commemorates the victory of the Jews over their enemies, and there's a festival, and during the festival, it's customary to consume alcoholic beverages, to celebrate in public, and to wear costumes and masks. At the exhibit opening, visitors were encouraged to stand behind the plexiglass display cases and have their picture taken, emulating how the curators thought the masks might have been worn or used in antiquity. At the opening, visitors were given masks to wear and selfies with masks were the order of the day. The Israel Museum's Facebook page asked the salient question, when was the last time you took a selfie with a 9,000 year old mask? According to James Snyder, who at the time was the director of the Israel Museum, he said that when we have that we have been able to assemble so many masks in a single place, first for intensive comparative research and then for display, is a tribute to the collectors that were so cooperative in making these treasures available to us, highlighting the museum's debt to the collectors and the owners of the masks. The exhibit was divided into three parts, a circle of 11 masks and plexiglass offering you know, uh, offering the opportunity for visitors to see the masks in the round. The combination of exhibit lighting and the plexiglass cases created an inspired effect on the blank space on the floor in the center of the room. So what you're seeing there is the lighting uh, through of the masks through the plexiglass. This was also true of the ceiling where you could also see them. Now, I in my lifetime have visited a lot of exhibits and I will say that this is one of the most visually arresting exhibits I have ever been to. So of the 11 masks on display, nine have no known associated archeological information. They're all on loan from the private collection of Michael and Judy Steinhardt. They were all purchased from the antiquities market. Only two of the masks on display have associated, although I would argue tenuous archaeological find spots, and they're part of the permanent collection of the Israel Museum. All 11 masks were displayed together with nothing distinguishing the archaeological masks from the market masks. No signs anywhere. This mask from the collection of the Israel Museum was originally purchased by Moshe Dayan in 1970, who at the time was Israel's Minister of Defense. After his death in 1981, remember I said he was donating everything to the museum? Well, that's not exactly true. Most of his material went up for sale and it was acquired by William and Lawrence Tisch, who donated it, who then donated it to the Israel Museum, where it's displayed in the permanent prehistoric galleries. The Diane mask, as it's known, was unearthed by a Palestinian farmer plowing a field north of the West Bank village of El Hadeb near Hebron. It's notable in this map. OK, and I know all you British people. I know the UK Daily Mail is less than stellar in their reporting, so I've helped them and I've fixed their map for them. Um, so the West Bank is labeled as Israel, which changes the geographical biography of the mask, um, which may have come from within the borders of Palestine. Later salvage excavations carried out by the Palestinian archaeologist Jibril Shur identified a site of some two and a half acres in size, which was dated to the pre-pottery Neolithic B. 
The Diane mask is made of fine crystalline limestone and covered by a gray patina. And it's compo uh, the patina is composed of calcareous deposits that form over time on the surface of things um, that are buried in soil. It's these microscopic components that might reveal whether the thing is ancient and might shed on some light on their geographic origins, the region uh, where, where it originated. The second mask in the, in the permanent collection of the Israel Museum was discovered in the spring of 1983 by archeologists Ofer Bar Yosef and David Alon, who excavated a cramped, dark, debris-filled cave overlooking the Dead Sea. The team included young students, Debbie Hirschman, who is the exhibit curator, and Yuval Gorin, who we'll hear from uh, later, who is the archaeologist who conducted the scientific analysis of the Steinhardt masks. The restorable mask fragments, you can see, uh, which is pictured here, they were all fragments put back together, were recovered by the excavation team outside the cave entrance in a back dirt pile which was the result of an earlier looting episode for people who were looking for Dead Sea Scrolls. So roughly life-size, the Nahal Himar mask is made of dolomitic limestone, and to date, it's one of the largest stone masks found thus far, and one of the few examples found at an archeological site. Far from any known Neolithic settlement, the excavators surmised that the cave was probably a repository. You know, ritual, because archeologists always say when they can't explain things, things are ritual. So for a, ritual, a repository for ritual things where ceremonial activities were carried out. The typology of the lithics in conjunction with radiocarbon dates placed this mask in the pre-pottery Neolithic B. As I mentioned, the remaining nine masks included in the exhibit are all from the private collection of Michael and Judy Steinhardt. There are no known recorded archaeological find spots for any of the masks in the collection, and the exhibit catalog and label simply state unknown site. An essay in the exhibit catalog speculates that at least three of the masks might have been discovered by famed members of the Bedouin Tamari tribe who were, are credited with uh, discovering the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s. But there's no archaeological or archival evidence to support that claim in the exhibition catalog. This curatorial conjecture, that's what I'm calling these moments where curators make these bold statements for which we have no evidence, um, ties the Steinharts to an important historic moment in the region, which fashions an embodied good in the form of connoisseurship, artistic taste, and a connection to the land, thus increasing the social capital of the people who own these things. According to the exhibit catalog and accompanying media hype surrounding the exhibit, the Steinharts agreed to loan their masks to the museum for the purposes of stylistic analysis of the similarities between their masks and the ones in the collection of the Israel Museum. But on closer inspection, the additional knowledge associated with the masks will increase the Steinharts' economic economic, cultural, and social capital. So 10 years of scientific analysis by Yuval Gorn, who is an expert in the comparative micro in comparative microology, microarchaeology, he's at Ben Gurion University. Um, he looked at the various masks presented in the exhibit and the accompanying catalog. He suggests that the masks in the Israel Museum collection, the Diane mask and the Nahal Himar mask are authentic from the Judean hills and the Judean desert. Okay, so that's not a stretch for us. Gorin also concludes that the masks from the Steinhardt collection are also authentic and originate in three possible locations, the Judean foothills, the Judean hills, and the Judean desert fringe, fringe which I would suggest are, are slippery mapping, it's a slippery slope of mapping terms. Gorin suggests that five of the Steinhardt masks and the Diane mask are probably from the same assemblage based on similar construction, patina, and style. Although recent court cases have demonstrated that using patina for authenticating ancient things is a tricky business because it can be faked, which I would consider yet another slippery slope. Even though Gorin does go on to admit, it cannot be proved that this entire set of masks was found in one spot, at one site, or at the same time. Theoretically, the masks could have been brought to the antiquities market from multiple sites from multiple looting episodes, but still he groups them together. 
This map from the exhibit catalog provides the possible find, stop, find spots for the undocumented things owned by the Steinharts, which is misleading in that only systematic archeological excavations would provide the necessary contextual evidence to state exactly where these masks originated. And if a cache of five masks existed in antiquity. Additionally, terms like Judean Hills, Judean Foothills, and Judean Desert intentionally conflate the current geopolitical boundaries of Palestine and Israel. Are the masks from the occupied territory of the West Bank? Are they from within the green line of Israel? 10 of the 16 maps, uh, masks on the map are undocumented, probably looted artifacts from perhaps within the modern state boundary of Palestine, but we'll never ever know for certain. But in the Israel Museum display and in the catalog, facts on the ground to continue the paradigm of Nadia Abu al-Hajj are established and the Steinharts benefit from a scientifically manufactured provenance that might be of use in future for both economic and social gains. Also in the exhibit catalog is this image from the Steinharts Home Library, which shows the masks below a Picasso and, th and this accompanying text. We have lived with these masks and the Picassos for the past 25 years and love spending quiet hours in our library together, surrounded by these evocative works. In his work on Asian collectors, Byrne suggests that sim the simple presence of a 14th century sculpted stone Buddha on one's coffee table in Bangkok implies one has taste and one's substance consists of more than just profits from one's chain of supermarkets. Both the Picasso and the masks indicate the Steinharts are more than just their hedge fund money. They are harbingers of taste, refinement, and class. Before its public debut at the Israel Museum in 2014, in Ju June of 2012, mask number eight, the watching mask, was offered at Christie's auction for an estimate, estimated four to $600,000. The auction notes refer potential purchasers to parallel references to masks from the Nahal Himar cave and from the Diane mask at the Israel Museum. The mask was cataloged as from a private New York collection. Whether it's the Steinharts who are the consigners is unclear and there's no record of the mask selling at the auction, but the mask in the image from the Steinharts library is the same as this mask that's for sale. Long before the Israel Museum exhibit, the Steinharts sought to increase their economic and social capital by offering a mask for sale at an elite auction house. As a result of some scientific conjecture, academic and museum endorsement, the mask is now provided with a new and improved provenance in the form of a fictitious cash. Should the Steinharts sell now, they could see an even greater return on the masks with the new and improved provenance created by this institutionalized state conferred through scientific study and public display in the National Museum. In the didactic material, the exhibit labels, the text panels, the exhibit catalog associated with the face-to-face -face exhibit, there was little or no discussion about the acquisition of the artifacts in the market or the undocumented nature of the 10 masks. There was a lot of acknowledgement about the generosity and kindness of the Steinharts and their loan, but no mention of how demand for archeological things like this mask can and does lead to looting at Neolithic sites. And here I'm using the Neolithic site of Wadi al Katafi, but please don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that there are any of masks of this sort at, out in the Eastern Desert where we work, um, although it would be sweet if we did find a mask or two. Um, by exhibiting documented and undocumented masks in the same space and providing scientific imprimatur of this created find spot and this fictional narrative about a cache of masks, the Israel Museum has added to the market value of the pieces, should the Steinharts decide to donate or sell their masks in the future. But they're not gonna sell, are they? Because after a four year multinational investigation in December of 2021, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office determined that the 180 items in the Steinhardt collection had been looted and smuggled from 11 countries, trafficked, trafficked by 12 illicit networks and appearing on the international art market without any kind of paperwork. 
Steinhardt surrendered, surrendered 180 stolen objects, valued at more than $70 million, and he has been barred from acquiring any other relics, whatever that means. And included in those 180 objects are the nine Steinhardt Neolithic masks. After the exhibition ended, three of the Steinhardt masks remained at the Israel Museum with an unknown status. It's unclear whether they're on loan, whether they're donated, and whether they've been accessioned into the Israel Museum um, collection. According to AP reporter Ilan Benzion, the DA says that three items at the, at the three items at the Israel Museum are effectively seized in place and the DA's office has open talks with Israel to coordinate the return of these masks and the additional and an additional 28 items. No mention in any of the negotiations is Palestine, even though as Yuval Goran has shown us, some of the masks probably originate from the West Bank. The grand jury statement of facts states, Discovered as a single assemblage of finds, the Neolithic masks originate from the Judean desert. The Judean desert lies in Israel and the West Bank. Here, the Manhattan DA uses the scientific findings of Yuval Gordon presented at the Israel Museum exhibit as facts on the ground. Even Professor Gordon was hesitant to say the masks were found in the cache, as he did that one disclaimer. We have no idea, and yet the academic capital produced by Gorin is used to elide the, again, the geopolitical realities of where these masks might come from. Recently, I received a copy of this volume by Professor Brian Hayden on the power of ritual in prehistory. And although I don't know Professor Hayden, I emailed him to ask about his choice of the mask on the book jacket. I'm sure he thought I was crazy. He could have chosen the archaeologically recovered Nahal Himar mask, but instead he chose a mask from the Steinhardt collection, undocumented purchased from the market. He said there were two reasons for his choice. One, the Nahal Himar mask is fragmentary and incomplete. Okay, so it doesn't look as nice. That's what I read there. And two, the Steinhardt mask is complete and is a powerful image that represents the kind of intimidating features that typify many secret societies, the topic of his book. The appearance of this undocumented Neolithic mask on the cover of an academic volume by an acknowledged expert on prehistory creates an additional cultural capital for the Steinhardts, acceptance by the Academy. In a recent lecture by Annabelle Fercon and Nigel Goring Morris, then and now 70 years of pre-pottery Neolithic research in the Near East, they used an image which includes both documented and undocumented masks to illustrate a point about PPN masks. In the question and answer, someone, and it was not me, I will just say someone else, asked, what do we really know about these masks? Professor Goring Morris admitted in his answer that the masks has, have a problematic backstory. But then he went on to reify the curatorial scientific conjecture, suggesting fine spots for the decontextualized artifacts from the market at the same time providing academic endorsement of the masks, resulting in more capital gains for the Steinharts. Uh, this is my very favorite uh, article that has come out about Steinhardt. Can you see these? This is his picture and then superimposed is a mask. This is so great. I think uh, kudos to higher arts for this. I don't know who designed this, but this really made my day. So. Um, uh, sorry, um, estimating the economic and symbolic capital generated because of face to face, the oldest masks in the world or the academic use is difficult. Market esteem for masks, created provenance, collector largesse in their loan, public acknowledgement of their collecting prowess, academic conf confirmation, all add up to an appreciation in cultural capital at a time when they may need it most, right? Such an action might cause their accumulated cultural capital to depreciate, or maybe the celebrity of crime may add to their value. Yet to be seen. Donnie Yates, Simon McKenzie, and Emmeline Smith argue that the market allows elites to convert their economic capital into a form of cultural capital through the long-term proje project of acquiring cultural objects individually and in batches that are then converted into a collection which in the symbolic world of high culture represents the collector's attainment of a particularly worldly status. 
If antiquities constitute cultural capital, looting and trade will continue. And this heady combination of a market that facilitates the creation of cultural capital from the acquisition of undocumented antiquities gives rise to the destruction of archaeological sites and objects. Worldly status can, can be and is conveyed through the medium of the museum, as is the case of the Neolithic masks. We, the museum going public, see artifacts on display donated by the Steinharts. We are filled with awe and admiration and gratitude for their donation and lo or loan. In return for this benevolence, collectors are imbued with greater cultural status and their roles as head fund managers are masked by an essentialized, naturalized social standing through the museum display of their acquisitions. Neil Brody has suggested that if antiquities are collected for reasons that are external to the objects themselves, for personal redemption or to provide a passport into polite society or for the creation of capital, this moves away from collection as an end at, to collections as a means to an end. The end here is the capital gains for the individual mediated through the museum, through museum valorization. All right, so I have a Follow the Pots project Facebook page where it has recently been described as a nerdy Facebook group with a lot of cool content and I'm okay with that and we post and share a lot of information on there so I encourage you to check it out. I'm also pretty active on Twitter where I'm also gathering information on masks and among other things and I'm going to stop sharing and take any questions and engage with Dr. Muir in some conversation. Thank you. Well, 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 thank you, Morag. I mean, really super, super stuff. I have to say uh, a really lovely presentation and, and a really provocative one. And I think it's one also that, um, let's see if we can. Okay, there we go. Seems like we're, we're, we're hyper sharing. Here. <laughs> Did I stop sharing? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, hang on. There, I think it's good. There we go. Are we good? That's great. Yeah. Oh, that's Sorry. super. Great. Thank you. No, and, and there's so much here for us to think about, and, and I think not the least of which is, you know, obviously for us to think about the role of institutions in creating these cycles of both the financial capital and the status capital that you've so well described. And I think also for us to think about um, maybe in the way that um, Yvonne Salini and uh, Gil Alal uh, and Eleanor Townsley of three authors together, they wrote a book back in the 1990s, late 1990s, called Building Capitalism Without Capitalists, that was this really nice exploration of Bourdieuian capital modes and talking about shifts, particularly in the collapse of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, in the way that there was a massive shift from an emphasis on social capital and cultural capital to economic capital. But just in what you described at the end, it's so interesting for us to think about how and Steinhardt's try to soften the blunt edge of their economic capital as being hedge fund managers to kind of quote unquote soften their position by being these philanthropists associated with the um, possession, but also the sharing of these cultural artifacts. And I guess if you maybe if you can say something more here, Morag, I mean, do you see this then as a, a kind of almost insidious uh, cooperation then between the institutions, the donor community and the market, where even if the Israel Museum in particular in this example, but say other museums or other institutions more generally, that they are reliant upon their ability to join together private pieces in larger collections or larger exhibitions that then makes for a blockbuster show, that then makes for the the Israel Museum to suddenly become a big player amongst other uh, large scale museums, the Rijksmuseum, the Louvre, the, what, the Met, whatever we we. Are. Thanks, that's a um, super helpful comment and uh, reference and also a very telling comment because what I didn't tell you, um, because to me, this is part of the rabbit hole that I've been down is um, Michael Steinhardt was also the chairman of the board of the Israel Museum until just recently. <laughs> so it's even okay. more insidious than you can imagine. Um, so, uh, um, and I 
was speaking to a class earlier today and I was giving the same example of the um, Steve Green Hobby Lobby family building the Museum of the Bible, buying antiquities to donate to their own museum and getting the tax break, right? So while um, Steinhardt did not build the Israel Museum, he is in fact building the Israel Museum as the chair of the board chair. And so, and he is also getting tax breaks for any donations he's giving. Um, and what I find interesting about him is that, yes, I think there is definitely a circular sort of connection between elite collectors, institutions, and the market, because there's an element of the market that we're not even aware of, which is the hidden market, right? Where collector to collector, if you are Michael Steinhardt and I'm interested in buying um, uh, Neolithic masks, I know that you have a collection of them and I found one, you know, as I found one just the other day in an auction house in Israel. So maybe I would just contact you directly and say, I have a Neolithic mask, I'm going to sell it to you. And there'd be no record of that sale in the public venue anywhere. We would have no idea who owned it before or any of its provenance history. And then Steinhardt would then maybe donate it to the Israel Museum. And so there is this circular, they all rely on each other. And uh, it's, as you just suggested, it is so insidious. And I'm not really sure how to move beyond it. Because as we've seen in a lot of these big, bigger institutions, um, museums and educational institutions, they're all embroiled with big name collectors, the Sacklers, the you know, Steinhardts, the White Levies, and they've all had problematic elements in their collecting histories or their um, economic histories. And so, but I'm not sure how museums can survive without them, like museums. No, and, and this becomes an interesting question uh, as well that maybe we can open up, you know, for, for the audience. But, but before we, we do that, um, especially in thinking about the role then that museums themselves play within the market so that they themselves are also purchasers, um, that, that they themselves then also, as you so nicely put it at the introduction, right, that they may actually add to the value of the pieces in the market because they've been exhibited um, in the, uh, the museum. In this case, and this may be a, a technical question to which you may not know the answer, but uh, okay, so that piece of information that Steinhardt's actually on the board of directors. Uh, so the three masks that then are left, on the one hand, is that a mode of protection of those items to keep them out of the hands of the New York district attorney? And even if it's not, if the New York district attorney somehow collected those objects, would they put them on the market? Like what would be the, the way that the legal system that the state of New York or a political body would dispose of this very valuable object that they seem to be seizing because it doesn't have the correct provenance? Well, I can only tell you what they're going to do with the masks. Um, I don't know about the rest of the 180 artifacts they identified as problematic in his collection that they forced him to seize. Um, so those three masks are part of the nine masks identified by the um, DA's office. And they are all going to be repatriated to Israel. Hmm which is what I find actually in this entire process, part one of the most problematic aspects, because in m museums, you can't have it both ways. If you're gonna have uh, Yuval Gorin do the scientific analysis that indicates that these are found in a cache that's probably in Palestine, then that's fact, you've created facts on the ground, which are quoted in the um, grand jury fact um, sheet. So then you have to actually enter into conversations with Palestine. <laughs> like you can't just give them back to Israel. If you, if you in your catalog have said that they might come from Palestine, but we are not going to do that because I've consulted my lawyer, uh, uh, legal guru, Patty Gerson, because the United States doesn't really recognize Palestine as a separate you know, state. And so we can't enter into a negotiation with them to give them back materials. And so for me, 
these museums who profess to be apolitical are actually more political than many other entities, which I find every day fascinating and also quite stunning. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there are some other things that I'd like to pursue here, but but I think rather than just a, a dialogue between us, let's open this up and then and then maybe I can insert some of these other questions as the conversation flows. So is there anyone else who would like to, to join the conversation um, who has a, a question for Mariah? Christina. All right, that was brilliant. I absolutely loved it. It was really fascinating. I have a kind of, um, uh, it's a question out of ignorance. You know those masks that have the very um, symmetrical round holes quite neatly and beautifully, you know, equidistant. What, what made those holes? Oh, uh, so, and I will defer because I think York might be on here and he's a specialist in ground stone, but I think that uh, you can use um, a stone tool to make those holes, but this is pre-potter Neolithic, which is not really my area of expertise. Um, and so you can use another type of stone to create those. Yeah, okay, York's giving me the thumbs up, so <laughs> correct. And, and they've come through that incredible period with no, I mean, they look immaculate. They do, don't they? Um, they carry me. I, I just, I was, you know. So they're pretty heavy. Um, and so this is also part of the exhibit showing you um, the mask to mask, tries to recreate how they might've been used in antiquity and to equate it to mask wearing in traditional societies today. But these masks are made of limestone and they're heavy. So I personally don't think they would ever be made to be worn on your face while you're standing up. Maybe they're death masks, you're dead and you're lying down and they put, but those holes were probably for attaching hair and not for, you know, putting on a string to wear it on your head. They're probably for attaching hair. Um, although this is all conjecture because we didn't find any hair attached to any of these things. Um, but they're absolutely, like I will say, I have been, as I said, I have been to a lot of exhibits, but I have never been blown away by the exquisite nature of the artifacts on display. And the, just the entire aesthetic of mask to mask was fabulous. I will send, um, you can visit it. They have an amazing 3D. You can do a walkthrough of it now online and they have the music playing. I'll send the link to that because it's really, it's really fabulous. And, and Laura, you're totally happy about the dating and, and all of that. That's all. Okay, well, I'm happy with the dating. I'm happy-ish, let's say. Okay, so we have 18 masks in the world. Two of them come from archaeological and even that is dubious. One is from a back dirt pile and the dating of those masks is associated to um, both radiocarbon dates but flint materials PPNB. Um, and then the other mask purchased by Diane was confirmed later by the Palestinian archaeologist who went back to the site where the farmer had dug it up. So I give that more credence. Um, and so the Diane mask looks like some of the other masks. So maybe they're all PPN. And there is a development of figurative and masks in the um, PPN. So the pre powdering Neolithic, that's not problematic. But as what we might think about, some of them, I mean, they could be fake. Easily. Honestly. Yeah, and, even, and the science would not tell you whether they were fake or not, because it could be local limestones that, you know, was from the... Judean foothills and so we could be having modern oh, yeah, yeah 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 I mean, yeah fascinating okay <laughs> wow so, so many rabbit holes oh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah oh that's great thank you Christina uh Trenum, please right. thank you Mark that was absolutely brilliant and very very provocative and a question about uh, the dynamics of capital markets in this case. It, does it make sense at all to talk about uh, kind of subsidiary markets that develop as part of this 
uh, as going out of the kind of work that you and your colleagues are doing as sort of status to be accrued through the the the, the denunciation and the, the the revelation of these very corrupt capital markets because you know just the fact that you're you do such distinguished work and we're fascinated it is a, it is it is its own sort of subsidiary kind of capital accrual and I when I ask that question I'm thinking about um, Weberian inspired analyses of successive ways uh, waves of religious reformation which sort of Protestant waves of Protestant Reformation as coming out of um, uh, critiques of the corruption of that which has preceded it, and that is a very that the, the sort of um, uh, purifying movements are their own kind of capital accrual systems. And I'm wondering if that resonates at all for you. Uh, it's a really good point, and I've actually never really thought about my own participation in this as part of the capital creation. And um, I will. Uh, it's actually it's super fascinating uh, to think about. So I really appreciate you raising this issue. Um, and I'll have to think about it some more because the, the only thing that um, I have thought about in the past and that Simon McKenzie, is, uh, who's a criminologist who works on these issues, has done a lot of work on is the celebrity factor. I'm not suggesting I'm a celebrity, but I'm suggesting that, um, well, and Simon has confirmed that there is like this cachet that goes along with collecting where I've been at an auction where the person in front of me bid on absolutely every single item that came up that had Diane, that was X Diane collection. So X Moshe Diane collection. It didn't matter what it was because it was a whole range of items. It was only about the fact that Moshe Diane had once owned that. So I think there is something to be said about these subsidiary, you know, sort of offshoot um, markets and our engagement with this. Um, I would say, like, I am not one of the leading players. I've quoted a lot of the leading players who really do market research, who are, um, you know, sociologists or criminologists. I'm more on the ethnographic side. So the project that is on hold, which hopefully in June will start, is I'm hoping to interview people like Debbie Hirschman, the curator, and Yuval Gorin, the scientist, about their engagement with the masks. And so my own um, uh, my own engagement or my own, um, I just don't, I just can't see myself as, or the work that I'm doing as creating capital. Although I guess if we're just discussing it and then this research gets used in these fact sheets by these grand juries, then I guess it does. Yeah, I, just to clarify, I didn't mean that in a critical sense at all, oh. just sort of in a descriptive sociological sense that this, this stuff is so multifaceted and it happens in, in everything we do. And so I'm just wondering if that, that that's all. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't yeah, intended no, probably as, a, as yeah. criticism. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't take it like that. I think it's actually, it's a really important point to think about. And I will, um, so I meet usually on Thursdays to, with all those big names I use. We meet, we have antiquities group every Thursday and I'll bring it up next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask them about their participation <laughs> and their research. <laughs> well, and here we have an interesting question in the in the chat from from Nicholas mm -hmm. Adams, and I'll I'll read it out. But Nicholas, if you want to add to this, don't don't hesitate to to jump in here. But but Nicholas writes, um, you discuss social capital as one of the benefits of these private collectors accrued by donating private antiquities. However, as a regular everyday member of society, you're more than that, Nicholas, but as a regular everyday member of society, when I see names like Richard Sackler's atop uh, of the Egyptian exhibit in the British Museum, I'm less than impressed. Um, is it that this type of social capital signif is significant in other sects of society, or rather is economic capital the main driving factor behind the desire to exhibit these pieces publicly? Uh, excellent question, and I'm not surprised you're less than impressed, and I think, because for me, uh, when I think of museum going public, I'm always envisioning my mother-in-law friend who lives in D.C. and loves to go to museums, and I don't think really, uh, and is educated and is well thought, but I don't really think she would care one way or the other if something was Sackler or not Sackler, but uh, Steinhardt would look at that and say, oh, Sackler gave that much money to the Smithsonian. I need to give more money to the Israel Museum. 
or White Levy's would look at that and say, we paid for the reno of the classical gallery at the Met, but look, so-and-so one-upped us. It's about collector to collector. It's institutional. It's, at, it's, it's among the elite. They don't really care whether you, the average going museum going public, acknowledge them. They care whether their peers acknowledge them. Just like they care in the marketplace when they're competing for one single item, they care that they're the victor. And they and it's really all often framed like a hunt and a victory when they are the successful at getting the cycladic figurine. Um, so and and that becomes really interesting, Morag, especially the way that you answered it, because in some sense it brings us right back to Bourdieu's original definitions, right, of social capital as being a reservoir uh, upon which individual members of a group can draw as a resource. But in a sense, right, it's not this open, ever expansive uh, field, to use Bourdieu's term, right? It's not a continuous field. It's it is a segmented field on which a particular habitus is playing out that there can be all kinds of other people that interact with the field but not are part of that field and then thinking about you know, what's the significance of the social network if if it's only elite to elite then part of this question is what's the role of the institutions in facilitating that kind of elite to elite transfer well they're part of the elite right so mm -hmm. You don't see Steinhardt giving money to the DePaul Art Museum, right? Because it's not as it doesn't have the cachet that the Israel Museum or the Met or the Field might have. And so there's also you have different levels or rungs of um, institutional um, peer to peer. Uh, and we get a really good example of that with the Association of American Museum uh, Directors where it's an exclusive group of people who direct museums, but not everybody. It's like the upper echelon of museums who all get together and um, decide the future of museums. No, and that's interesting. A student of mine, Olivia, mentioned in class today, at the end of class today, a very interesting book about this social capital among philanthropists. And here we might see the example, right, where if you're really into philanthropy, then you do give to the DePaul Art Museum as a way of exposing more people at an early age to, you know, more different types of art. But that's not what's going on here. This isn't driven by philanthropy. No, this is a I guess a reification of it and it's a it, particular types of art right it's not even you know it's not all art it's like particular types and so you get the classical ideal and you get the you know and most of um, Steinhardt's collection is more classical it's just he has these nine Neolithic masks for whatever reason I think for him they were a good investment and for him it's about a tie to the land so it's not only an economic investment, but he, and you may or may not know this, he's also the funder of Birthright. The, uh, you know, bring high school students back to Israel to get them to encourage to make Aliyah and live there. So he's the pr uh, primary funder of that. So he's always about tying it back to the land, to the land of Israel. And so these pieces belong to that land. And so I think that's part of his thinking and purchasing them because they're kind of out of the ordinary for the, given his other collections, which is a lot more classical in, in scope. So, and, and, and please other people, if you're you're here, if you'd like to, to join in, don't hesitate to raise your hand or, or put something in the chat. But, but as we think about this, Morag, then is part of this just this is the, the political economy of, of museums? <laughs> and and Naya, do you do you want to jump in here as, as well? You obviously you can ask a completely different question than than that. Uh, yes, I mean, I do think it's about the political economy of museums. And I think, as I've said previously, I think it's it's fundamental to them staying afloat because they rely on big ticket donors and um, I, I, I don't think they can move beyond that. Yeah. Not yet? Oh, it's Liat. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Liat. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Liat. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Morag, for this uh, very uh, interesting talk. Um, I will ask this. I, I myself 
I'm an Israeli. I'm also a former employee of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And for me, this discussion uh, is so, um, I would say it's, it's like uh, a very important moment for Israelis to maybe take an opportunity and, and turn, turn this very sad um, affair into something positive. So I would ask how, how should Israelis respond? How should the Israel Museum respond? I'm, I'm really thinking about this. Uh, for me, it all goes back to um, the legality of trading antiquities in Israel. And this is something that you have uh, really uh, pointed out in your research. Mm -hmm. So how can how can we um, turn this into something positive, maybe to end legal trade of antiquities in Israel? Um, thanks, Liat. So I'll just say Liat and I know each other. So, so yes. <laughs> um, but it's not a setup, the question, because it's actually we've had a lot of conversations about this. Um, uh, so. I'm going to answer it in two parts because I think what can the Israel Museum do right now with regard to the masks because that's what we're talking about. So they have three masks in their possession. They could absolutely step up and say we need to figure out whether these should go back to Palestine. But you and I both know that's never going to happen. So, But that's for I would say to engender goodwill and to figure out like how, you know how to move forward in being um, a better allies, I guess, museum to museum, that's absolutely what they should do. But answering your second question about stopping the trade in antiquities, well, I'm not Israeli and it's not my business to say that they should trade or not trade, but they absolutely could um, be better about the monitoring of what they what how the trade happens and you and I both know there is a big loophole in the law and they could do more to uh, close up the loophole and then there would be because ultimately that law is designed so that the, the market um, dries up so it's supposed to be only things from pre-1978 should be available for sale so at some point people will have purchased everything and there'd be nothing left in the market I think that the original framers of the art of the law thought that that might be what happened um, because it was enacted when Moshe Dayan was in the Knesset and Teddy Kolek was the mayor of Jerusalem and they were both big collectors. And so there was a lot of vested interest in continuing the trade. Um, but it's uh, I think it'll be a really it'll be a long time before um, that happens. And I know it's not for lack of trying for people at the Israel Antiquities authority or at the Israel Museum because there's a lot of goodwill in both of those places but there's a lot of um, economic partners both Palestinians and Israelis who would like to see the trade continue it's money to be made so thank you so much uh, I, I yeah I fully agree and, and I hope that maybe um, there is some sort of public conversation in Israel and, and maybe in Palestine too about this so hopefully good things will be um, evolving. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you, Leon. Yeah, and, and just to that last point, Morag, that there's money to be made by the trade continuing. Is that the idea that exhibitions can continuously have new items, that there are new things to share? Or, I mean, what becomes the, the way that money is made by the trade continuing? Um, most of the money in the trade is made from people like my mom going to the Holy Land and buying a uh, early Bronze Age pot, paying a hundred bucks. The bulk of the trade is in low end sales. It's not in the high end. I say that, but honestly, we have the statistics or the market value for the high end trade because there's that hidden element. I honestly don't know how much money is changing hands when things are moving around and the high end or elite trade also includes museums because I think there's a lot of collector to museum not that they're paying the museums paying the collector the museum is uh, the collectors getting the tax write off and so I think there's a lot of movement of material that way but the bulk of the tour of the antiquities trade is in tourists low-end tours one thing and then in that sense is is the state whether it's the state of Israel or the United States or the state of France I mean are they too uh, say part of the 
the consideration here because they're the ones that write the tax policy, because they're the ones that write the laws on on trade and the movement of antiquities. If should states then be more attuned to their role in facilitating this? Absolutely. And, you know, I think they in the last I would say in the last 10 years, years they've become more aware and I think these high profile seizures and forfeitures and um, uh, and I think a turning point was the connection that some colleagues made between the trade and antiquities and the funding of ISIS and insurgency. I mean it's probably a whole lot less than the statistics that are out there but there is a connection. We have documentation, documented uh, fact that um, Abu Sayyaf was trading in antiquities and then using the money for whatever. Um, so that's bad press. And so government stepped up and became, you know, that's also uh, terrorism. And so governments took notice. And so I've seen in the last 10 minutes or 10 years and uh, other folks can agree or disagree. Um, but there's been a change in government oversight and interest in the in the topic where before we couldn't really get much purchase. But now. Tied to terrorism, people are interested. Just said. Yes, Christina. You're muted, Christina. Um, thought I'd undone it. Sorry. I just wanted to do a follow up question on that. Was that why um, the DA started to look into uh, this guy's collection? in the first place? No, um, this is uh, it's uh, I'll only tell you what I think I know and I actually don't know why they started. I, I don't know for sure, but I think what happened was in 2000. This is actually a good learning moment for all collectors out there. But in 2018, uh, he loaned three of his um, sculptures to the Met Museum for an exhibit, uh, a classical sculpture. And so uh, the Met curator was doing some background research to write the labels and realized that those three pieces had been looted from Lebanon just 10 years before. Wow. So he had already, and he's no stranger to court cases because if you remember the Fiale, the, uh, there was an Italian uh, gold bull from I think the 1990s. That was him too. He owned that. And uh, anyway, he's no stranger to uh, buying unprovenance material, but it was that Met curator that then called, you know, Homeland Security and then he got involved. And those things have been since, so they were um, seized and they've been repatriated. But it was that seizure that I think allowed the DA's office to get more search warrants to enter his apartment and to find and identify other material. I think well, that's. What's Therefore, presumably part of, uh, you know, this sort of consideration of what should one do? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these uh, um, museums, all these public institutions should surely be absolutely rigorous about provenance. Yes. Should they not? Oh yeah, you would think, right? <laughs> Let me just say, <laughs> they're getting, you know, just like, Four years ago, the Met Museum gets caught out buying a gold mummy, uh, you know, a sarcophagus that was looted uh, during the um, Arab Spring. And oh, so, wow. you know, uh, um, wow. you know, the I've talked to a lot of museum folks and the lure of artifacts, just like for collectors, it's it's very um, enticing. I will say that there's also been a change in museums and that. They, we are increasingly seeing more and more provenance curators, which we have not seen up until now. Uh, admittedly, a lot of them are focused on Nazi looted art, and um, but recently, I mean, there are more provenance curators today than there were 10 years ago. So clearly museums are taking this a lot more seriously, and they're also interrogating the materials that are, they're getting donated and turning things away. So, so we are seeing, a slow, let's say, paradigm shift. Uh huh. Very interesting. Hmm. I think there's room to be optimistic. Hmm. I have to be, or I would just cry. Trenum, <laughs> <laughs> would you like to yeah, add something? I think, that, I think you've just um, 
inadvertently started the analysis I was suggesting about how you have these subsidiary movements if there is a rise in uh, provenance curation. That could be, you know, sort of where, where one could start to look at how these, these uh, reaction, these purifying reactions begin and what then, what are sort of the career uh, um, trajectories of those people and where do they go in coming years and does this, does this become, um, well, if it becomes entrenched with what real effects or otherwise does it have? I think there's a really great case study of the Getty in that because they were embroiled in a whole lot of mess in the 90s and early 2000s with some illegal antiquities and dealing with Bob Hecht and um, it's all really well documented in a book called The Medici Conspiracy and they now have provenance curators at the Getty. Mm. So they have more than one and so I think you can see a direct cause and effect uh, if somebody gets bitten, then they're doing more due diligence in the future. And I guess maybe, maybe oh, go ahead, Trina, because I was going to make a follow on to, to that. No, nothing more, nothing more. Thank you. No, so I guess just to wrap it back into the context of, of this talk, uh, Morag, I mean, would we then see this kind of increase, and maybe this is what Trina means by subsidiary markets, that there would be a new, uh, social capital, cultural capital accrual system that would then be based on privileging those objects that are collected with provenance against those that are not, right? That, does that itself become a new system of accrual or, or are we talking about something that's a little bit more technical than, but more technical to the museums rather than the system of social capital that you've introduced in the talk here? No, that's absolutely true. And we've already seen that, that the market rewards provenance. Uh, and so I use that example of the mask that was on uh, sale at Christie's. And, you know, it was unprovenanced. It said, you know, collection of whatever ex Rafi Brown. He is actually a dealer. So saying it's ex Rafi Brown just means it comes from a dealer. But let's say none of this um, recent incident happened with Steinhardt. So his stuff has been on display at the Israel Museum. So the provenance for that material now becomes exhibition catalog Israel Museum. So people are more likely to buy it and reward that than they would have prior to it being on display. Yeah. So I guess as we maybe think about drawing this to, to a close, I mean, is, is that maybe the both the hopeful that you just said, so, it, so it's not bringing us to tears. Right. Um, but, it, but is it also then just a, a study about systems of capital accrual and systems then of um, these social networks and that perhaps calling out the ways that social networks benefit themselves, perhaps at the expense of St. Nicholas as you know, the regular museum going public, uh, that those kind of elite systems can get broken? Or are we talking about just kind of reforming the pool from which elites are drawing their own social capital? And it's probably not going to be about a much wider, say, political conversation. I think it's more realistic to think it would be about reforming than it would be about to changing the whole system. Um, I think it's a more attainable goal in reforming, you know, creating, I've written on creating better collectors who ask all the questions and don't buy the stuff that's iffy, right? I mean, that's absolutely what we need are better collectors because collecting is not going away, either institutional or individual, because we all want to go to the Met and see something new. So it's not like they're going to stop collecting. And the Getty has an endowment of $90 million they have to spend every year. And so they have to find stuff to buy. And so, um, but I think reforming the current situation and rewarding good provenance is the way to go. And I think um, that's probably if you ask museum folks, and I'm not a museum, I've never worked in a museum, that they would tell you that that's what they're trying to attain is a better, um, better collecting in their practice. And and does the state have a role in that that could, could you know, licensures on, on import or, you know, export controls require detailed provenance as a way of preventing things from moving even if a collector has the money to buy if they don't have that that cert certification then you know customs agents are going to let the pieces through or is that there's such a, a it's such a porous um 
I don't know, uh, environment in which pieces move that maybe that doesn't catch things? I, I don't know. No, it's, it's a good question because my pals at um, Customs and Border Control and in the AUSA offices will tell me or confirm that less than 10% of anything coming into a country gets checked. So that's everything like guns, drugs, anything, any shipment coming in less than 10%. But we that doesn't mean that we as a government and wherever you are situated right now can't impose more checks more balances ask people to uh, you know fill out their customs forms look it's a fedex guy who brings down steve green and his you know because he thinks it's hanky that five shipments are going to different hobby lobby locations and they say ceramic tiles from turkey so that's what we need is more greater, I guess, transparency and more um, training. And there are organizations working towards that. Like that's not what I do, but it's what a whole bunch of people like the FBI Art Theft Squad and Interpol and agencies in the UK, Scotland Yard. I heard an amazing talk last week by someone at Scotland Yard doing art theft work. I mean, so there are agencies and, you know, it's a lot of it is about border control and movement across borders. And so that's, and that involves a lot of cooperation, right? And so that's harder to attain. Well, Maura, Kersel, thank you. It's a really super talk. I think there was just a really, really interesting uh, discussion. And um, it would be great if you can, you know, um, send the link uh, to the exhibition. I'll go ahead and link that to the Center for Art and Politics webpage. Um, this talk, uh, which is recorded, will also be posted to the Center for Art and Politics uh, webpage. So if you'd like to tell any of your friends or colleagues um, about this discussion with Morag um, and, and the really, really interesting argument that was presented here, uh, you know, please let them know. Um, and then please also know there will be another event from the Center for Art and Politics uh, later in the spring in uh, in April, the Irish artist um, Elaine Byrne will uh, be talking about her art on borders. And uh, please look at the Center for Art and Politics webpage in the future for other events that will happen, particularly um, in the autumn. Uh, but more, I thank you so much for for sharing your your research, your research, and thank you so much for such an interesting um, conversation. And and I'll just say, I think what you're doing is such important work, and. Uh, well, you can tell I'm pretty sure. passionate about it and it's become my life. That's all I do. Um, but I will say these, this has been so helpful. I really appreciate all your comments and all the engagement because it's given me a lot to think about, which is really helpful for me because sometimes I get a bit, I get in the weeds with the masks and that's where I am right now. I'm putting together <laughs> a database of the masks, but I, as an archaeologist, I need to move beyond that. So <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. And, and thank you all as audience. Thank, thank you. you for spending your evening thank with you. us. All right, that was brilliant. That thank was really you. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.